Good afternoon, this is Mr. Stewart. It's Monday the 3rd. I'm recording this for Friday the 7th as an experiment. I hope this experiment works. I will be happy to uh, take critiques and comments at the end. You should get out your note sheet that I've provided for you. Uh, Gauss's Law, we're going to we're going to go in the order of the note sheet. Gauss's Law for electric fields, Gauss's Law for magnetic fields, Ampere's Law, the Maxwell correction to Ampere's Law, Faraday's Law, and then some summing up. So Gauss's Law for electric fields. This was one of the first things we talked about in E&M. This, this, this set of notes is really the summation of everything we've done with E&M. Gauss's Law for electric fields starts off with now, this is the differential form of it. If you integrate it over a volume, then that's going to tell you about that's going to tell you about the flux through the surface. That's going to tell you, that's going to give you that the flux through the surface is the enclosed charge over epsilon naught, which is what we talked about in class, which is the formulation we used in class. It's the more useful formulation. It can be a more useful formulation if you have a nice area or if you know that the field is perpendicular to the area. But this is the more the, the formulation on the note sheet is the more general formulation. This tells us now when you see that that upside down triangle, what's what I'm calling del, that tells you when you see that dotted into a vector, that tells you it that tells you you're looking at how things are pointing, how things are pointing outward or inward. It's called divergence. So this tells you that when you have a charge inside a surface, you're going to have the field pointing out through the surface, poking out through the surface, or poking into the surface, depending on the magnitude of the charge, of course. And it should make sense that if you integrate that over a volume, you should get a charge, because when you integrate a density over a volume, you get whatever it's the density of. So Gauss's Law Part 2, del dot b equals 0. Again, this talks about, mag about a magnetic field being pointy, being pointing out or in. But it's a 0 on the right-hand side. So it's still it still should be a row over over in this case mu naught but if it's always identically equal to 0 what do you think that means i'll give you a moment to think about that and that's actually been invalidated by some recent research so but what that really means is that no no magnetic charge can exist you can't in other words you can't have an isolated north or south pole without the other pole so that's what that's really what part 2 of gauss's law means that's the meat, that's the meat of it that's what the zero on the right hand side really means okay ampere's law which we talked about last week Ampere's law, the, when you see that del crossed with a vector, that tells you about the curl. It tells you how it's curling around. Now, what do we need? What do we know about curls? What do we know about something that's curling around? It never has the same direction. It, the direction is dependent on the point in space. So, when it circulates, it circulates in one plane, obviously. So how do we define the direction of that? We define it with the right hand rule, where we where we put our right hand curling around and stick our thumb up, and that's really what the direction of the curl is. Well, that's how we get our right hand rule for magnetic field from a current. Because we stick our thumb in the direction of the current and curl our hand around. Well, that's the curl of the field. So the field is going in that in that circle because that's how curling that's how the curling of it works. 
Well, Ampere's law tells us two things about the relationship between fields and currents. One, it tells us that the field's proportional to the current and inversely proportional to the actual distance around. But it also tells us the direction of the field. It tells us that we can use the right-hand rule to get the direction of the field. Okay, Maxwell corrected Ampere's law because experiment showed that when you had light, and I'm just going to use light as a generic term for electromagnetic waves, but when you had light in free space where there isn't any current, when there, isn't, when there aren't any currents, you still had, you still had a magnetic field that, di that didn't vanish. You still had a magnetic field that was a curl, that had a curl. So he added that epsilon naught mu naught partial E partial T term to, to, in, to agree with the experiment because electromagnetic waves still propagated in free space far away from any currents. So there needed to be that other term to show that the changing electric field was what was causing this magnetic field. Now Faraday's law, which we talked about Tuesday, del cross E equals minus db dt, or partial b partial t. So again, magnetic flux, when the magnetic flux changes, that's going to create, that's going to create a curl, a curling electric field. Well, what's a, cur what's a curling electric field? Current in a loop. Current in a loop is a curling electric field. So if I change the magnetic flux through a loop, then I'm going to get a current through that loop. And the minus sign is Lenz's law, which we also talked about Tuesday, and briefly on Monday. Lenz's law, remember Lenz's law says that induced current will oppose the change in magnetic flux that caused it. That's, that's the whole reason for the minus sign. So this tells us that changing flux gives us a current. But changing current will also give us a change in flux. So, and I talked and I talked about and gave you the formula for that earlier in the week. So let's sum up. So Gauss's law is going to deal with stationary charges. Stationary charges create pointy, create pointy fields. Ampere's law and Faraday's law talk about moving and changing charges. Changing charges and moving, changing fields and moving charges create curling fields, create circulating fields. So that's really Maxwell. That's really the way that Maxwell's equations work. And we're going to talk more about Maxwell's equations. They're not going away. It's not like they're going away because we still have electromagnetic waves and light to talk about and relativity to talk about because really the Maxwell equations were part of the thing that led into special relativity, that led Lorentz and Mach and Einstein into special relativity. So it's not like this stuff's going away. It's still important and still interesting stuff. Uh, critiques and questions are welcome. Uh, Constructive critiques, please. Questions are certainly welcome, and this is all I have.